The Infocani, or Difficani, was a series of wars in southern Africa between 1815 and 1840. The combatants of these wars include the Soto, the Zulu, and Swazi people. These wars would shape the scope of southern Africa for many years to come. The victorious chieftain calls this series of conflicts the Infocani, which translated to English means the crushing. The defeated chieftains call this series of conflicts the Difficani, which translates to the scattering. The Infocani occurred as a result of three main factors having to do with corn, water, and ivory. In the early 1800s, African chieftains began growing corn. This crop resulted in high yields, which increased the population to unsustainable levels. This caused a shortage in water. Southern Africa also went through climatic change at the time, making the area drier. There were more people, but there were less resources to go around, which resulted in a greater level of conflict. In addition to food and water, Africans also competed over the ivory trade. By the early 1800s, Europeans from Portugal had established trading posts all along the coast of eastern Africa. Already engaged in competition over food and water, Africans competed over capital that resulted from the ivory trade. I wanted the name Teto to stand for peace, not total war. I wanted my armies to bring subjugation, not destruction. To subdue another tribe, you must strike it once and for all. Total war, total subjugation to the paramount king, and total destruction to anyone who raises even a whisper against him. The victors of the Infocani, or Difficani, were the Zulu. The clip we just watched was two African leaders arguing over the usage of total war. Traditionally in African warfare, it was only the armies that engaged each other. In total war, civilians were now fair game. The leader of the Zulu, Shaka, was one of the first advocates of total war. This tactic deprived the enemies of the Zulu of the resources necessary to continue warfare against them. The Zulu also devised the cow horn tactic, which is the one shown above. Traditionally, African armies lined up in two large groups across from one another. Shaka split his group into three, allowing him to surround and completely destroy his enemies. When the opposing army had exhausted their throwing spears, the Zulu engaged them in close combat. This had a devastating effect on the opposing army as they were unarmed after they threw their spear. Shaka also outfit his soldiers with different weaponry. The Zulu carried short stabbing spears in addition to the long throwing spears. Salute your king! Buena Wendo! Buena Wendo! Buena Wendo! In addition to militaristic changes, Shaka also made cultural changes to the Zulu. Shaka separated his soldiers from their families at a young age and forced them to pledge loyalty to him. Thus, the Zulu were a more cohesive unit than most of the armies they faced. The other chieftains involved in this conflict call this conflict the Difficani, or the Scattering. The defeated chieftains were forced to move away from the area. The Soto people moved south and formed a large state there called Basotho. This state is where the modern country of Lesotho gets its name. The Swazi moved north and west and formed the state of Swaziland, which remains a country today. While the Zulu look at this time period as a time of great victory, other groups in the area see this time as a time of great suffering. The perception of these wars today is dependent on who is telling the story. Africans today continue to debate whether Shaka Zulu is a hero or a villain. After the Infocani, the Zulu were left as the dominant state in southern Africa. The Swazi and the Soto had also formed major states, 
What was once an area of many small states became an area of a few large states. In addition, the nature of warfare in southern Africa had changed. The desperation of the conflict, caused by shortages of food and water, changed how warfare was conducted. Chieftains no longer spared civilians in battle. The implementation of these total war policies caused many of the chieftains to lead the area. This depopulated the area, called Natal. The depopulation of Natal allowed Dutch settlers, known as Boers, to come settle there. Prior to the Infakani, many Africans would have been living in the area. However, because the area was depopulated, the Dutch met little resistance in their settlement. The political structure, the conduct of warfare, and the ability of Africans to defend themselves against European settlers had changed. The Umfakani, or Difakani, will forever be remembered as an event that altered the world in one way or another. How? Well, that just depends on who you ask. 19th century Southern Africa saw the Zulu peoples emerge as one nation with a common purpose, united under a single king. Prior to this, the Zulu were a collection of family-based clans free to roam, hunt and cultivate the vast plains and hills of the Nguni Plateau, whose dreamy landscapes rise from the Indian Ocean in Southern Africa. One African leader, Shaka Zulu, rose like a sun king to create a nation from the numerous chieftainships that swell the land of Southeast Africa. Shaka was a military genius and created Spartan-like warriors. Under his reign and in the years that followed, a generation of men emerged who defeated a British army and destroyed the royal lineage of a European dynasty. By the 19th century, Shaka Zulu, king of the Zulus, had changed the face of Southern Africa. In only 11 years, Shaka ruthlessly conquered 2,000 square miles. After his death, the Zulu would conquer near a million miles within the next 50 years. This is the story of Shaka Zulu's legacy. Shaka, the Zulu king, had achieved the impossible. He turned a group of warring clans into one nation. He had built upon the blood of his Spartan-like warriors and left an enduring military legacy. They would defend their land against the intruding white European settlers. Many battles were fought and many would die on both sides. The Zulus protecting their land as the settlers founded their new homes. This is the story of the terrible clashes of what Shaka left behind. The Zulu warriors and the colonizing forces of the British and the Voer trackers. In 1879, South Africa's powerful Zulu nation would soon be locked in a violent struggle for survival. The British army, pressed by the land-hungry white sectors, attacked. The Battle of Isandwana proved to be the Zulu's finest hour. Six months of bitter fighting followed, which saw the nation utterly defeated. King Tetsuo himself became a British captive, the great royal homesteads were burnt to the ground, and at least 10,000 warriors were killed. For the Zulu people, the way was paved for a century of colonial exploitation, which has lasted right up until recent times. Its rise, its fall, and its famous fight against the British. We'll see a small tribe become an empire. We'll see European factions playing out the game of power on South African shores. And we'll see a late post-Napoleonic army, well-drilled and equipped with modern rifles, be beaten by an indigenous population wielding nothing more than spears and hide shields. But before we can do so, we need to talk about sources. There's a lot about this period that we just don't know. It's not like this in Goku Jidai, where it's simply hard to find translations of the more obscure records. In this case, we're dealing with a culture that didn't keep written records. So all we have to go on are scant accounts from European traders, and oral histories collected decades after the fact. 
Much of what we're gonna tell you, especially about the early period we're covering, are best guesses by the historians and archaeologists who have worked tirelessly to piece together the puzzle of exactly what transformed the Zulus, a tribe perhaps as small as 1,500 people living in an area probably around 10 square miles, into an empire of 250,000 people, ruling over an area roughly the size of New Jersey. So, with that caveat, let's start laying out the background. Who were the Zulu people when this all began? What did life look like for them? How did they subsist? What was their government, their economy, their military? Well, they were a relatively minor tribe within the larger Bantu people, who occupied a region in what would now be the eastern part of South Africa. They had a largely pastoral economy, with wealth being measured in cattle, and the population mostly subsisting on maize and milk. They operated under a kingship, but they had very little in the way of what we would consider centralized governance. And war? Well, when our story begins, somewhere in the end of the 18th century, warfare in this region was more of a ritual affair than a destructive endeavor. Warriors would meet at a predetermined location and fling spears and insults at one another, but would rarely move in for close quarters fighting. This left the casualties very light, and it was almost unheard of for the winning side to follow up a victory by chasing down their opponents or sacking or conquering their land. Instead, battles would result in the transfer of a small amount of territory, or some cattle. But Shaka, who will be the central figure in the early part of our story, changed all this. He changed the weapons, the tactics, and perhaps most importantly, the philosophy of war in the region. He brought in close quarters combat, replacing the traditional long throwing spear with a shorter thrusting spear that was devastating when used in a melee. He developed a system of envelopment tactics known as the bullhorn formation, which I'll explain in more detail later. And he changed war from a means of settling minor disputes to an activity of slaughter and conquest. So who was Shaka? Shaka was the eldest son of the leader of the Zulu people, but he was considered illegitimate, and so wasn't named the heir to the Zulu kingdom. In fact, his name, Shaka, means intestinal beetle, which was sort of the cover story for his mother's untimely pregnancy. This becomes kind of hilarious when you realize that we in the West often call him Shaka Zulu, and since the word Zulu actually means heaven in the Zulu language, we're basically calling him intestinal beetle heaven. So, enjoy that. Anyway, at the age of seven, because of his illegitimacy, Shaka was sent to live with his mother among the Ilangani, a neighboring tribe. From there, he moved on to the Matetwa, the most powerful tribe in the region, where he served as a warrior first for a man named Job, and then for Job's successor, a man named Dingiswayo. Dingiswayo took notice of Shaka's unusual prowess as a close combat fighter, and when he discovered that Shaka was actually of royal blood, put him in charge of an Ibuto, which you can basically think of as a regiment. And it's here that Shaka really began to refine his tactics. The traditional Ibuto were armed with long throwing spears, and while they practiced the use of their weapons, they didn't do much in terms of practicing unit tactics. Generally, they would show up to the battlefield as more of a loose mob than a cohesive fighting unit. But Shaka began to experiment with this. He armed his men with a short stabbing spear and drilled them in a tactic that he called the bullhorn. He'd split his men into three groups, the chest, the horns, and the loins. The chest would charge the enemy and pin them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Then the two branches of the horns, positioned to either side of the chest, would flank and envelop the pinned enemy. This whole time, the loins would sit behind the lines, acting as a rested reserve to be applied where needed. Interestingly, it's been said that Shaka would have these men sit with their backs to the fighting so they wouldn't become panicked or charge over eagerly before he needed them. The brilliance of this system was that it was simple. Without much battlefield coordination, every man knew what he was supposed to do. If you're in the chest, you charge. If you're in the horns, you get around their flank. The system's simplicity meant that it could be applied in chaotic conditions without much of the signaling that was required by modern armies. With these deadly new weapons and tactics, Shaka became a force to be reckoned with. And when his father died, he decided it was time to take his own. Shaka's half-brother, the legitimate heir, took the Zulu throne. But with the help of Dinjis Wayo, Shaka quickly had him assassinated and simply moved in to take over the place. Dinjis Wayo was still the chief of the Zulus, so Shaka continued to serve him. But only a year later, Dinjis Wayo was killed by a man named Zwide, the ruler of the Ndwandwe, one of the most powerful tribes in the region. Shaka vowed vengeance for his leader's death, and stepped in to fill the void Dingiswayo had left behind, bringing the Matetwa, and with them many of the other local tribes, under his control. Shaka's vengeance, and the war he was about to bring, would lead to a period of unparalleled chaos and devastation. In Zulu, they call it the Mefikane. In English, we simply call it the Crushing. But before we delve into the crushing, we should talk about why war here became genocide, and why the region was so primed to explode at the first signs of strife. 
A lot of it has to do with European influence. Not because Europeans tried to cause it, in fact there were many Europeans who tried to help, but given how radically different, how wealthy, how technologically separated the Europeans were from the local population, their mere presence dramatically destabilized the region. As European trade increased, new crops were introduced, which led to a population increase, which in turn led to greater competition for land. Meanwhile, European ships would trade for cattle to resupply their food stores, which made cattle even more valuable and led to an increase in raiding. At the same time, European traders also came looking for ivory, and to get ivory, you have to take down elephants, which requires a large degree of coordination from a group of people, which some have said led to the more coordinated and far more deadly tactics that Shaka was able to implement. To add to all of this, a drought caused the more water-hungry European crops to fail, which led to a famine. So the area, Natal, was already primed for disaster. Zulu identity was shaped by a series of powerful kings. According to oral tradition, the original Zulu chieftain was established in the 17th century by the founding patriarch, Malandela. It was his son Zulu who gave his name to the people. Zulu means heaven. They became known as the Amazulu, the people of heaven. They settled in a region that would eventually become known as KwaZulu-Natal. Bounded by the Drakensberg Mountains in the west and the Indian Ocean in the east, it's a landscape of rolling hills, deep river gorges and fertile grasslands. I do love this bit of South Africa, KwaZulu-Natal. There's something about it that feels very authentic. I mean, so much of South Africa is so like Europe, but this feels really like Africa. At the end of the 18th century, the Zulu were just one of a patchwork of small chiefdoms that occupied this region. For over a hundred years, they'd lived in relative peace, raising cattle and cultivating their fields. But then everything began to change. Trade was the catalyst for the transformation of the Zulu people from a small local chieftain into a major regional power. Europeans had been trading in southern Africa since the 16th century. On the west coast, the Dutch and later the British controlled the city of Cape Town, while closer to Zulu territory, the Portuguese had a trading post at Delagoa Bay. In exchange for ivory, cattle and slaves, the Portuguese and other European traders supplied copper, brass, textiles and beads. But troubles brew. By the end of the 18th century, rival ethnic groups were competing more and more aggressively for access to trade routes that linked to Delagoa Bay. Trade with the Portuguese was vital for local power and influence, but not everyone would get access. Small chieftains were in danger of being crushed by their larger rivals in the fight for goods to trade with the Europeans. The small Zulu chieftain was suddenly vulnerable. But out of that turmoil would emerge a man who would change Zulu history forever. His name, Shaka. Shaka was a king and a soldier and the founder of the Zulu nation. In the space of 12 years, in the early 19th century, he transformed the small Zulu chiefdom into a large and powerful military force. Although he became an icon of the Zulu people, Shaka's legacy remains deeply contentious, something not helped by the myths that surround his biography. What's really frustrating about Shaka's life is that there are hardly any contemporaneous written records. We have to rely on second-hand written material and oral testimonies, most of which is conflicting. The lack of reliable evidence has left room for multiple interpretations of Shaka, many of them highly romanticized. Respected sources 
suggests he was born in the 1780s, the eldest son of a Zulu chief. For reasons unknown, he was raised in a neighboring chiefdom, where he learned the skills of statecraft and soldiering. As inter-ethnic conflict erupted, he returned to the Zulus, seized the chieftaincy, and transformed the lives of his people. One legend portrays Shaka as a benevolent patriarch. As a young man, he is said to have worked as a herdsman. One day, he was out in the fields when he was distracted. As a result, he lost his herd. The shame he felt had a profound effect according to the story. Shaka learned from his early experience as a herdsman that it was important to look after every single member of your flock. He spent the rest of his life trying to compensate, making sure that security and discipline were the central focus of Zulu life. To explore one view of how Shaka built the Zulu kingdom, I'm meeting Makawi Biela, a descendant of Shaka himself. Before Shaka, there was no Zulu empire. Shaka, in his through his intelligence, is the one who created the Zulu empire. After he came to the throne, he said, OK, now what I'm going to do, I will go from clan to clan. Chieftain, I will approach each and every chief and I will just unite people using the spear. I united them in order for me to establish the great Zulu Empire. But were people scared of him or did they respect him or was it a mixture of the two? Mixture of the two. Some feared him because for those who refused to join his, his faction, you know, you, they, they knew very well what would happen to them. Yeah. A spear would be put into you. There are so many other people who said, no, we cannot tolerate this. We cannot live under your control. But there must have been good reasons why people stayed within the Zulu nation. What was so attractive about the Zulu state that Shaka was building? What were the wonderful things that he was giving to the people that they didn't have before? Well, the thing that people never had, they were not united. They were like having small clans here and there. He was emphasizing unity. No separation, no isolation, no quarrel, nothing. He is trying to unite the people. He's trying to create our, our identity as Zulu people. Many Zulu today venerate Shaka as the protector and defender of the people. They give him credit for reforming an institution that shaped Zulu identity and transformed its fortunes, the army. These warriors are members of a ceremonial Zulu regiment. Today, they perform on formal occasions, but in Shaka's time, regiments were the backbone of Zulu society. When Shaka assumed the throne in 1816, he decided to build upon recent innovations of local chiefs. He introduced a system of conscription, divided his soldiers into regiments called Amabutu, and these were to revolutionize Zulu society. Under the Amabutu system, young men left their families around the age of 14 to work and fight in regiments. Separating young men from the rest of Zulu society was a way of shifting their loyalty from local chiefs to the Amabutu and their king. One of the leaders of the regiment is Ungamizi.
The Zulu monarch, known simply as Shaka, is remembered for one of two ways. On the one hand, he's described as being heroic, strong, and a courageous leader. On the other hand, he's looked at in a more negative light, some describing him as a bloodthirsty lunatic who loved nothing more than brutality. I guess like all those with murderous intentions, we can take a look at their childhood, and sometimes like in this instance, we can see where it all began. Shaka wasn't a planned baby. His father Senzanga Connor, a minor Zulu chief, would court the daughter of another chief, a young woman named Nandi. The community had a generally accepted tradition whereby unmarried couples could engage in sexual activity without having actual intercourse. The idea was that it would relieve sexual tension between young people and help them cope with lustful thoughts as well as to prevent pregnancies. As you can see in this case, it didn't go as planned and one thing sure led to another. When Nandi's pregnancy was found out, Senzaka Connor would come under heavy fire from his peers. But instead of owning up to his obvious blunder, Senzaka Connor said that Nandi wasn't pregnant at all, and that her menstrual cycle had simply messed up, and that she'd been suffering from a parasite in her intestine, causing her to miss her periods. Whether or not he was believed was unknown, but nine months later, Nandi popped out Shaka, and there was no lie that Senzanka Connor could hide behind. Interestingly enough, Nandi actually named Shaka after the name of the parasite that Senzanka Connor had fabricated. As a boy, Shaka would help his father herd the sheep, and little else is known about the nature of his relationship with his father, or what type of child he was early on. The catalyst of his character comes in pretty soon though, as one day, Shaka was tending to the sheep. The sheepdog seemed to turn rabid though, and pretty soon, it was able to wound and then murder one of the sheep. Senzaka Connor was furious with his son, blaming him for the death of the sheep, as if he could have done something to stop it. Nandi was quick to defend Shaka, but as a result, the pair of them were banished from the village by Senzaka Connor. Over the next few years, Shaka and his mother would travel from one village to another, often rejected and abused by each settlement they tried to join. They would finally find refuge in a settlement belonging to the Mumfefwa, a powerful and dominant group that owned the region. The Mumfefwa throne was currently sat upon by King Dingus Whale, a man who built a federation of nearly 50 tribes through both diplomacy and outright war. By the time he was 16 years of age, Shaka was noted for his intelligence, courage and strong resolve. He would become King Dingus Whale's senior herd boy, looking after the sheep in the same way he'd once done for his father. By this age though, he had developed a lot more agility, understanding and patience, and wasn't about to allow a dog to kill one of the sheep again. In fact, one story has it that he once stood single-handedly against a leopard that had come to pick off the herd. In this story, when the leopard pounced, Shaka was able to cut it down and skin its furs from its body. So impressed with his skill and courage, King Dingus Weyo offered him his own cow. It wouldn't be long before Shaka outgrew the role of herd boy and would soon graduate as a warrior. But wars in the time of Zulu weren't originally four as you might imagine. They would consist of two bodies of warriors facing each other at a distance of around 150 feet. Then, each side would take turns casting light spears at each other until one side had enough and began to retreat. If the victors gave chase, they could impose total triumph over their enemy and forced them to surrender, a sign which was given by the dropping of one's weapons. But Shaka believed that this way of combat was, well, pointless. He would think, what was the point of slinging spears at each other for hours on end? Especially when the spears that were thrown weren't usually enough to kill a man. No, Shaka wanted to intensify the battles and make them more effective in deciding a winner. Basically, Shaka wanted blood. In the next battle, he would close in on an enemy and engage him with close quarter combat. When the enemy threw spears at him, he would block them with his shield, edging closer and closer. When it was safe, he would charge forward, maneuver around the enemy's shield and stab him to death with his light spear. In fact, he was so outrageously brazen that he would even discard parts of his armor issued by King Dingus Weyo himself, citing it slowed him down. If that wasn't enough, 
He even developed his own type of spear for combat, as the light throwing spears were said to break when used to stab at an enemy. His new spears would have a massive blade attached to a stout short handle. They called it Iklwa, a reference to the sound that was made when it was thrust into someone's guts and pulled out again. Over the years, Shaka's lust for blood became insatiable. He would go on to defeat other chiefs, killing others in cold blood, all as he expanded the territory controlled by the Zulus. It's here some say that he grew insane, some stories citing that he would have his own warriors clubbed to death if they showed the smallest sign of weakness. Warriors who were wounded or crippled from the battle were murdered. Warriors who showed compassion to the enemy, murdered. Warriors who didn't shout loud enough during the battle, also murdered. One thing was for sure, Shaka wasn't shy when it came to the disciplining of his own men. To further add to the idea that Shaka had indeed gone insane, it's noted that he would have his concubines killed if they became pregnant, for he was so paranoid that the woman in question would raise the child to rebel against him. He would assume control of the throne after the assassination of King Dingus Weyu, going on to win over other clans through diplomacy and patronage. Sure, he would crush many other tribes and absorb their stragglers into his own army, but for the bigger tribe leaders, like Zihalanlo of the Maquis, Joba Sifol, and Mafubani of the Fuli, Shaka would simply buy their loyalty, saving the needs to engage in skirmishes with armies that might have left his own bloody, or worse yet, defeated. Despite his cruel ways, there was a part of him that was perhaps kind-hearted and empathetic, but this part of him was reserved only for his mother, Nandi, until she died. The repercussions of this woman's death was explosive. Shaka simply couldn't handle it. After all, his mother had been by his side from the very beginning. His mother had effectively kept him alive through her own sheer will to find them a home when they were banished. To say he was heartbroken at her loss was an understatement, but I think something else broke in his mind, that is to say, if it wasn't already broken. He faced his followers and forced every single one of them to mourn for his mother. If they did not mourn, or did not show enough sympathy for her death, he'd have them killed. He worked to ensure that no new crops were planted to commemorate the death of his mother, an idea which would kill hundreds if not thousands through starvation. He also demanded that no milk was to be produced and that any pregnant women were to be killed so that the world would know of his misery firsthand and so that he didn't have to mourn alone. Animals were not exempt from this purge either. In fact, cows were slaughtered, simply so that their calves would know what losing a mother felt like. In total, 7,000 people were said to have been executed under these conditions. In 1828, however, his half-brother Dingane had about enough of the madness. Along with another half-brother named Mulangana, it appears they would make at least two attempts to assassinate Shaka before they were finally successful, though the nature of these failed missions is unknown. Either way, it's understandable that Shaka knew people wanted him dead, if he was in the brain space to actually conceive anything other than his mother's death. His own death likely took place in September, as this is the year that most of the Zulu manpower had been sent north to sweep the land for resources and expansion. This left the royals lacking for security, a detail that didn't go unnoticed by the assassins. The half-brothers recruited a third unnamed man to assist them in their assassination plot, where they were said to create a diversion to catch Shaka unaware. When they apprehended Shaka, they quickly killed him and dumped his body into an empty grain pit, which was subsequently filled with stones and mud. The exact location of Shaka's final resting place has never been found. What do you think about Shaka? Was he a crazed madman who grew addicted to violence? Or do you sympathise with his brutal ways, considering the death of his mother? Do you think his life might have been different if he wasn't exiled from his own home as a child? In the early part of the 19th century, there was a set of conflicts, conquests, mass migration and dislocation across southern and central Africa that was collectively known as the Imfakane, or the smothering. And there were a lot of causes of the Imfakana, a population explosion, a drought, contacts with European culture, but central to it all was the rise of a powerful, expansionistic, militaristic kingdom under the leadership of a charismatic king who was one of the most gifted military strategists in the history of the earth.
And if you want to understand the rise of Shaka Zulu and the Zulu Kingdom, the place to start is the 1818 Battle of Gokli Hill. The Zulu Civil War started before the Battle of Gokli Hill, but the battle represented a turning point in the very nature of the conflict and well demonstrated the skill of the personality that drove the rise of the Zulu, the key dynamic in the Imphakane. In 1818, the Zulu, under their 29-year-old king Shaka, were a minor tribe, vassals of a larger kingdom that was in the process of decline in the face of a rival, the powerful Nadawandi kingdom. At Gukli Hill, Shaka used a number of strategies that would be recognizable on the battlefield today. Deception, guerrilla warfare, decoy, but to understand the nature of the battle, first we have to understand the nature of the way that Shaka transformed the very way that the Zulu fought wars. Traditional warfare among the Zulus had been done with relatively light throwing spears. The two armies would stand at a respectful distance, they would shout insults back and forth, and they would throw their spears until one side or the other decided that they had lost. It was almost more ceremony than warfare, and the casualties were relatively light. But Shaka decided that this was pointless, that it made more sense to fight in close combat where you knew you had killed your enemy. And so he changed the weapon from a long light spear to a short, long-bladed stabbing spear that worked more like a sword. It was called an Ikthwa, and to give you an idea how brutal this kind of combat was, that name, Ikthwa, represented the sound it made when you withdrew it from a person after stabbing them. Shaka also changed the size of the traditional lozenge-shaped cowhide shield that a Zulu warrior carried, making it much larger. That gave more protection against the throwing spears, but it made it heavy enough to use as a battering weapon. As opposed to standing at a distance and throwing spears at each other, the way that Shaka saw a fight was that you would charge your enemy with your heavy shield, hit them hard to knock them off balance, hook their shield with yours to pull it back and create an opportunity to stab them with your ikwa. It was a brutal and effective change to the way that the Zulus engaged in warfare. Moreover, Shaka expected his warriors to have a greater level of training and discipline than ever before expected of the Zulu, with hours of training turning them into peak physical specimens. And then he formed them into distinct military units called impis that were much closer to the lines of European armies. It was in the context of this change in warfare that the king of the Netawande sent his oldest son, Noman Lanjana, with 12,000 warriors to attack Shaka and his mere 5,000 warriors in April of 1818. The Netawande were expecting to annex the Zulu lands, and they expected that it would be an easy fight. The first tactic that Shaka used was to use guerrilla tactics. He would use small forces to contest river crossings and thus slow the advance of the Netawande. This is a tactic that would be well understood on a 20th century battlefield. Shaka used that time to move his people out of harm's way to the fringe of Zululand and then to strip all the land that the Netawanda had across of all useful supply so that they had exhausted their supply before they even got to the battle. When it came time to fight, Shaka chose his ground carefully. He placed his army on top of a hill, Gokli Hill. But the hill had a large depression on top, and that way Shaka could hide his numbers and his preparation from the enemy. Then Shaka employed a diversion. He sent a small bit of his army, leading a bunch of cattle, off in the distance where the Netawande army could see them. Noman Linjana took the bait. He thought that that was Shaka moving all of his cattle, which represent wealth in Zulu culture, and he realized he had a chance to catch them. He sent nearly 4,000 men of his force chasing after Shaka's diversion. Shaka had a great defensive position on the hill, but he had to goad Noman Linjana into attacking him on the hill. And so he hid most of his troops in the depression to make it look like he was smaller and weaker than it really was. Noman Linjana took the bait. He thought that this would be simple. He said to one of his generals, this will be like slaughtering cattle. But as the Netawande moved up the hill, they realized that it was difficult to bring their numbers to bear because as they climbed the hill, the units started crushing together. And then when they were pressed together so that they couldn't maneuver, Shaka sprung a trap. His warriors used the impetus of the hill to charge down and use their brutal close combat tactics. The Netawande army was thrown back. 
Noman Linjana wasn't stupid. He knew what was going on, but he just didn't have an answer. He tried several different modes of attack, but all of them were thrown back because the Zulus had the advantage of the hill and the powerful close combat tactics. Moreover, the Netawande army was tiring. They were climbing up and down the hill, and they'd run out of the water that they carried with them. And they were starting to straggle back towards the closest river, which was nearly two miles away. Unknown to Noman Linjana, Shaka had prepared for this. Up in the depression on the hill, he had water and food for his troops, so that his troops were refreshed while the Netawandi army was exhausting. What Chaka lacked was time. He knew eventually the 4,000 warriors had gone chasing after the cattle would return. He had to goad Noman Linjana into one more attack so that he could defeat the main army before the other force came back. And so what he did was rearrange his warriors so that it looked like the units were more depleted than they were. Noman Linjana at the bottom of the hill saw these depleted units and assumed that they were as exhausted as the Netawande were, that they'd been fighting on a hill day, all day with no water. And he took the bait. He assumed that one last mass attack would overrun the Zulus for good. And so he personally led 1,200 warriors up the hill one last time. But Chaka had a last trick up his sleeve. All day he had been hiding a significant reserve of warriors that Noman Linjana didn't even know about. As his troops moved up the hill, Shaka threw in his reserves. They charged around and flanked Noman Linjana's army, capturing that entire force, encircling them, and killing them all. Noman Linjana and four of his brothers died in the fight. Then it was an easy mop-up to chase down the rest of the army, which broke and ran. In the end, the Netawandi army lost 7,500 of its warriors and five of the king's sons. The Battle of Gokli Hill wasn't the beginning of the Zulu Civil War or the Imfakane, and it wasn't the end of the Netawande. They were still a much larger force than the Zulus. And the Zulus had taken significant losses. Chaka lost nearly 2,000 of his entire 5,000 person force and many cattle. But the failure to defeat Shaka in 1818, when he was at his weakest, would have long-term ramifications. When the two armies met again a year later, Shaka had absorbed many smaller kingdoms and was far more powerful than it had been before. And, one more time, he used brilliant tactics to defeat a much larger force and eventually defeat the Netawande. The Battle of Gokli Hill is what set Shaka Zulu down the path of creating the Great Zulu Kingdom. The ripple effects of the Zulu conquest were massive. Displaced people like the Netawande now had Zulu weapons and tactics, and they would move along conquering and subjugating other people as ripple effects went all the way through southern and central Africa. In the end, the effects of the great migrations of the Imfakani would cost the native population of South Africa as many as two million lives. That depopulation would then facilitate the expansion of European settlements in South Africa, though it would also create the great native nations that became the greatest obstacles to those European settlements, and it would set up a series of colonial conflicts that would continue throughout the 19th century and still impact borders, politics, and conflicts today. Rarely has one personality so greatly affected an entire region, really half a continent. Shaka Zulu is as important to the history of Africa as Napoleon was to the history of Europe. Shaka Zulu, the most famous of all the Zulu kings, is a figure whose role in history is much debated. His influence on the South African culture with his own 1980s TV series, Pop Song, Killing Rock, Theme Park, and Airport shows his importance to South Africans. He was born around 1787, and at his death in about 1828, through either diplomacy or battle, he held sway over the massive portion of Southern Africa between the Pongolo and Mimzingolo rivers. Shaka ruled over a quarter of a million people and could muster more than 50,000 warriors at the drop of a spear. He favoured the short stabbing spear, was famed for marching his army 20 kilometres a day and making troops walk barefoot over thorns. His bullhorn tactic of surrounding enemies before the main force went in for the kill marked him as a military genius. Like Caesar, he was killed by someone else close to him, Dingane, his half-brother. 
Half man, half myth. South Africans are divided between Shaka as a military genius or ruthless conqueror. Shaka Zulu, your majesty. Yes, the founder of the greater Zulu nation and the Zulu empire reigned from 1816 to 1828. Most definitely one of the greatest military geniuses in history. And certainly on the level of a Caesar or an Alexander the Great. Imagine, if you will, the prodigious feat accomplished by this 19th century African Achilles, Shaka Zulu. In less than 12 years, he transformed a handful of, ideally, relatively harmless herdsmen, who were by nature reluctant to engage in any form of warfare, into a Spartan army of over 80,000 highly trained, ruthless warriors, extending his influence over most of Southeast Africa. An empire compatible in extension and might to that of Napoleon, and in treachery to that of Genghis Khan. Your Majesty, uh, gentlemen, the war machine created by Shaka Zulu was so monolithic, it has survived his death by almost half a century. Yes, yes, the crown has now defeated it, but that defeat is purely temporary. It can and will rise again and again if we do not stop it once and for all. And why? Because King Shaka was no ordinary mortal. He was a messiah, a god figure. Like an African Mephistopheles, he gave the Zulus glory in return for their souls. Wielding the forces of life and death on an endless battlefield of blood and carnage. Your Majesty. Ma'am, the threat is real and the decision before us clear. Therefore, the colonial office suggests that we constitute within the Zulu Kingdom a progressive destruction and dislocation of the military and economic system. So doing, we feel that the Zulu people, deprived of central leadership, will revert to the state of innocuous bliss that they enjoyed before the insane conditioning of Shaka. I tend to agree with Kimberley. If the Zulus won't bend, break them and be done with them. That's what I say. I rather think we'll be doing them a favor. A return to the plow should prove to be most therapeutic for these savages. We might even bless them with a hint of civilization. <laughs> Am I meant to translate, my lords? That won't be necessary, sir. We have so little in common, especially our concepts of human respect. Thank you, your lordships, for your chivalry. Shaka Zulu mean to you? He was one of those rare men who had the courage to live his ideals and to instill his dreams into the hearts of his countrymen. That is precisely why we cannot give you back your realm. Shaka Zulu is more alive today than ever. His military strength still prevails. You are the king, but it is his spirit which rules your people. We are a practical woman, your highness. We will not form an alliance with a legend. And so it was that the empire created by Shaka Zulu some six decades earlier was disbanded. The king's territory subdivided and placed under British supervision. The resultant political mismanagement, continual white interference in the ensuing strife, would effectively destroy the House of Shaka. From this time on, the Zulu people would only be able to dream of the dignity and the glory given them by their legendary king. This, then, 
is his story. The first time that Europeans began to feel the ripple effect of Shaka's war machine was in 1823. The Zulu king was at the height of his power. But like most military despots, Shaka had become both master and victim of his regime. His empire, having been born out of aggression, now required continued war action to keep it alive. successfully attacked and crushed all the immediate neighboring territories, uniting the defeated tribes into a single Zulu nation. But Shaka needed more victims, not only to satisfy his propensity for war, but to keep his huge army employed. And so regiments were sent further afield to enlarge and enrich the empire. And as they did so, those who did not wish to subject themselves to Zulu rule fled before the onslaught, often attacking others in their fight. The effects of this tremendous upheaval touched not only the people at which it was directed, but began to be felt by the British colonists at the Cape, who themselves were beginning to expand northwards. It was, therefore, inevitable that sooner or later the two empires would clash. As a result, the governor of the Cape Colony, Lord Charles Somerset, was prompted to send an urgent communique to London. To Lord Henry Barker, His Majesty's Secretary of State for War and the Colonies. My Lord, in consequence to your Lordship's wish that I communicate in writing my deep concern for the future of the Crown's colony at the Cape of Good Hope, I beg leave to submit the following evidence regarding the menace of the Zulu nation under its king, Shaka Zulu. Since he ascended the throne of the Zulus in 1816, Shaka has forged one of the mightiest empires the African continent has ever known. In less than six years, his small, insignificant tribe has risen from obscurity and given its name to an all-powerful nation organized into a fearsome military machine. Shaka is known as a mass murderer, a depraved ogre, whose thirst for conquest knows no limits. He has deluged his country with innocent blood, disregarding the most sacred ties of affection, turning father against son, son against brother, in a bloodbath that defies description. Shaka Zulu, a warrior king who founded a nation, but at a terrible price. Nobody has ever accused Shaka of being cuddly. Nobody. <laughs> Cowards and failures had good cause to fear him. They were thrown off a cliff and down into a river to be eaten by the crocodiles. Shaka, the Zulu king whose mighty war machine beat the full power of the British army in battle. In the early 19th century, Shaka Zulu claimed the throne of a tiny African tribe. He went on to forge one of the greatest empires Africa has ever known. Today, Zululand lies on the east coast of modern South Africa, a land of misty mountains, fertile valleys, and majestic rivers. In 1816, when Shaka Zulu came to power, 
his people ruled over just 100 square miles. But his ambition had no limits. Building the Zulu nation was an extraordinary achievement. In just over 12 years, his military force had conquered more than 20,000 square miles of land. He fought against different tribes, so as soon as the tribe gets defeated, then he usually took all the belongings of the tribe, taking the wives, taking the livestock, and take, putting it under his control. His vast armies had defeated 100 tribes, and a quarter of a million people submitted to his authority. It was a rule of fear. The Zulu's finest hour came against the British at the Battle of Islanwana. Even after he had died, Shaka reached out to inspire the Zulu warriors. This was Shaka's legacy. It was the people trained by Shaka using military applications invented by King Shaka, uh, which really stopped the British Empire briefly in its tracks when it tried to roll into Zululand. Shaka invented new military tactics and trained highly disciplined warriors, but he had a grip of iron and was utterly ruthless. There are stories that he used to review his army at the end of a campaign, and the commanders would be asked to say, well, who didn't behave well, who hid behind their shield or hung back? Uh, and Shaka would have these people brought out and have them killed off in front of the whole army. You only have to have half a dozen people killed off to make the point to everybody else that actually it's better to get in there with a fighting chance than it is actually to face Shaka's wrath when you come home at the end of it. The 19th century English trader, Henry Francis Finn, who met Shaka, wrote in his diary, Shaka's lust for blood is unstoppable. Shaka asserted his harsh authority just here, under the so-called coward's bush. Woe betide the warrior who lost his spear. And for those who lost their spears on the Beckley field, and will ask, where is your spear, my friend? I lost it, my king, on the Beckley field. And then he'll just take his own spear and put it right on top of the foot of that young man and he'll start turning the spear very gently and he'll just ask the warrior, do you see that you are weakening my power as a king? How come you lost your spear? It was just a horrible lesson he could give to his warriors. Shaka was a cunning strategist. He also knew the power of psychological warfare. People literally would avoid his gaze rather than look into the spiritual abyss, into the, to the darknesses of the universe, which stared back at them from King Shaka's eyes. Now, personally, I think that's something he was acutely aware of. It was very much part of his intimidating manner. He used it in the same way that he used physical violence. Shaka's success owed much to his highly disciplined regiments of thousands of warriors. The Zulus called them impis, but his skills weren't confined to the battlefield. He was also a clever diplomat and far-sighted politician. Around him, he managed to forge alliances with a number of chieftains with whom he did not fight and he didn't massacre them. He didn't wipe anybody out. He forged very, very subtle alliances, taking them as they came and working different relationships opportunistically, as any good politician does. At the height of his reign, Shaka ruled from his magnificent royal residence at Kwa Bulawayo, on the hills in the north of modern-day KwaZulu-Natal. Shaka's court was the center of all power. There were massive displays of dancing and singing. The performers called on the spirits of their ancestors for strength before battle. The Zulus, certainly in the 19th century, believed that the most powerful ancestral spirits were focused through the person of the king uh, and this aura sort of followed him around. The fate of the royal family affected every Zulu. This was doubly so with Shaka, whose close relationship with his mother, Nandi, dominated his life to the end. Her death had devastating consequences for all Zululand. After his mother died, the whole nation mourned. Nobody could cultivate it on the land. Nobody could like do what, what was used to be done while his mother was still alive. There was a sign of, for the rest of the nation to mourn for that short period of time. The outpouring of grief led to atrocity and excess. The funeral was horrifying. The dead woman's handmaidens were buried alive with her. Elsewhere, the rapidly spreading violence shook Shaka's very kingdom. 
There is a story that when Shaka's mother died, in a, an outpouring of grief, he actually had thousands of people uh, killed across the country. Now that might be exaggerated, there might be other things going on in the background there, uh, a need to eliminate political enemies, but even if you scale it down, here was a pretty tough man. He was a man who was, uh, who was prepared to hold the nation in an iron grip as he forged this new kingdom. But it was when that same strength turned into reckless brutality that Shaka started to lose his kingdom. The Zulus are an ancient people. According to legend, they came from a mystical land in Central Africa called Imbo. The word Zulu actually means a high place, the heavens above. One usually translates the name of the people, the Amazulu, as the people of heavens. It means kind of up there. By the late 18th century, the Zulu was still an obscure tribe, numbering about 1,500 people. They lived in a fertile valley south of the White Mfalosi River, below the border of modern Mozambique. There were many other scattered tribes in the region, all farmers and hunters, but they were all brave and dangerous warriors when they needed to be. Shaka Zulu himself was born in 1787, the illegitimate son of the Zulu chief. Nandi, his mother, was from a quite different tribe settled nearby. My suspicion is that he may have been conceived out of wedlock, but that Nandi did marry Senzanga Kona in the normal way later. But there was always maybe a little bit of a, a slur was possible on Shaka. And that came into later succession disputes. He was the Zulu chief's eldest son but the confusion about his birth meant that Shaka was not recognized as heir to the throne. Relations with his father were fraught. Relations between his parents were just as bad. Eventually, the friction between Shaka's father and his mother, Nandi, led to both mother and son going into exile. And Nandi was supposedly a very strong-willed woman. She went back to the Elangeni, her own people. Uh, and Shaka then, she took Shaka, her young son, with her. He grew up away from his father's people, really cut off from the male side of his family, from the people of his birth. Much of Zulu history was passed down by word of mouth, and the details are hazy. There's quite a lot of evidence that shows that Shaka actually did grow up in Zulu country under his father's wing and only fell out with him as a young man, not as a child. In exile, Shaka and his mother were treated harshly by her own Elangani people. They were outcasts. This way they were thrown even closer together. And this fierce bond with his mother contained the seeds of Shaka's own destruction. But the hardship he and his mother went through only strengthened Shaka's willpower and independence. He spent his early years as a herd boy looking after the precious cattle, but everyone soon saw that Shaka the warrior had special skills. He was so good at Zulu stick fighting that he was only challenged by boys who hadn't heard his reputation. No one who had heard about him dared to fight him. From these traditional stick fights, Shaka developed the aggression which marked his whole life. He supposedly grew up lonely. He may have been embittered. It's difficult at this distance really to get a, a sense on how it affected him personally. But he then grew up ultimately amongst a people called the Mtetwa, and it was there that he became a young warrior. Shaka was conscripted into the Mtetwa army. Their chief was called Dengazweo, to whom the Zulu were then subservient. Dengazweo had become chief through fierce warfare and clever diplomacy. He had built up a federation of more than 50 tribes. Shaka actually spent maybe a decade under Dengazweo learning the trade, learning the trade of war, learning warriorship, distinguishing himself in battle, and probably learning a lot of political skills as well. Dengazweo deployed his warriors into well-defined regiments so he could better control his men in combat. This gave him a tactical advantage. 
Chief Dingus Weyo became Shaka's teacher and mentor. Shaka was fascinated by military tactics, and he questioned traditional fighting methods. There was a lot of fighting going on, but Shaka was the man who came up with a new system, a new technique, a way of using a different weapon, of using large bodies of men together to exploit the advantages of that weapon, which gave him very much a tactical edge. He was keen to improve the effectiveness of the Zulu's chief weapon, the spear. He had rigorously practiced and played with spears as a youth. Well, this is the sort of weapon technology that was popular before King Shaka's time. Uh, it's fairly simple. It's a throwing spear. It's made out of steel that was produced locally, fastened to a wooden handle. It's lightweight. It's accurate. You threw this at somebody at 20, maybe 30 yards range. King Shaka said that it's not good enough for us to use this spear that was used by my father because there is a lot of disadvantages in it. He said when you throw your spear to your enemy, sometimes you miss out and your enemy picks up the very same spear and throws it back to yourself. So he decided to introduce his own spear, the stepping spear. He preferred this. It's a much heavier weapon. It's got a much bigger blade. It's got a shorter, stronger haft. This was a weapon that was designed not for throwing but for stabbing. And as you get close to him, you batter him with the shield like this, knock him aside, hopefully expose his body to an underarm thrust with this spear like that. And King Shah could listen to the sound that the blade could make if it goes into the man's tummy. And then he was so interested in that. It, it went if you pull it out. It might happen that the blade stuck into the ribs or rather at the backbone of the man. As the blade stuck there, you just take your foot and you put it right on the chest of the warrior and you pull it out. So as it comes out, it makes the very same sound. And King Shaga named it I Kwa because of that sound. I on the way in and Kwa on the way out. I Kwa. Shaka is said to have spent hours sitting on his own and dreaming about future conquests, empires and how he could win them. He didn't just dream. He distinguished himself as a formidable warrior and was renowned for his personal bravery in battle. In his praises, he is referred to as somebody who likes to get stuck in when he's fighting, a spear that is rid to the very handle. Uh, he wasn't a person who held back and threw spears at other people. He liked to get in close. And there is right in that the very heart, the very essence, I think, of Shaka as an aggressive personality, as a ruthless personality, uh, a person who believed in fighting that means could be achieved through the use of violence. Shaka argued for what is called MPE Bambu, total war, war that is red with blood. He thought that Dingus Whale's policy of leaving the defeated survivors to fight again another day was far too gentlemanly. He wanted complete victory. There is a sense that he had a definite vision from the word go of how he could build a strong African people out of these disparate groups who were already in conflict with one another, how he could resolve those conflicts by bringing them all together. Uh, and the rival chiefs, the Amakosi as they're called in Zulu, uh, either had to go along with Shaka or he would quite simply attack them and defeat them and make them go along with him. Shaka's use of weapons and his military tactics were so successful that Chief Dingus Weyo appointed Shaka as his commander-in-chief. But this was only an apprenticeship. The biggest challenge was about to come. In 1816, the Zulu chief, Shaka's father, died. Could the illegitimate son seize the throne? Southeast Africa in 1816 was a mountainous landscape inhabited by hundreds of marauding tribes. Shaka, the exiled son of the Zulu chief, had come back to claim the kingdom. He set out his stall by slaying a lion on a hunting expedition. Shaka Zulu went with his brothers to the forest and he killed the lion by himself and his brothers were, started to be very scared of him, including that brother was already appointed to be a chief of the Zulus. And then from there, he then said he is a king of the Zulus. And nobody could oppose him because they could see that he's strong enough, he's powerful, he, he, he might sometimes kill them. Over the next 12 years, he transformed the Zulu tribe from a small clan into the most powerful empire in South Africa. It was a two-pronged strategy. Shaka Zulu entered into friendly alliances with neighboring tribes, but ruled his own people with absolute authority. In a whirlwind of public executions, Shaka is said to have ordered the clubbing to death of anyone who threatened him or might oppose him in the future. 
definitely there's a certain ruthlessness which is right at the heart of, of Sharka's personality uh, and it's very much part of his approach to, to battle and to controlling the people. Obviously when you embark on a campaign of conquest the first thing is that you have to defeat the enemy. It's very much a case of if you don't fight I will kill you. <laughs> Shaka's legendary ruthlessness has given him the image, not just of a fearsome leader, but of a bloodthirsty tyrant. The myth of Shaka, the mythology of Shaka, seems to be as hard as iron. It just hangs in there. No matter what historical research is done or whatever challenges are made, the myth just powers on like this juggernaut. Much of what we know about Shaka comes from two white adventurers, Nathaniel Isaacs and Henry Francis Fenn. They were not the most reliable characters. Isaacs was 16 or 17 when he was wrecked here. He spent maybe three or four months with Shaka at most, and then went off and became a slave trader. He was a nasty piece of work. Finn was probably on the run from the law in the first place, having robbed the store at Bathurst. Those are the two major white sources, and both of them colluded to vilify Shaka. They made Shaka out to be a monster. When Henry Francis Finn visited Shaka, Shaka welcomed him. But Finn repaid the hospitality with a gruesome account of life at court. Shaka, with a flick of his hand, would order the execution of one of his entourage. Skulls would be smashed. He also had men seized and their eyes taken out of their sockets. There are so many myths about him in so many different cultures. But there's no doubt in my mind he was a very ambitious, very ruthless, very innovative um, and really quite far-seeing political leader. Uh, he was a man who had a vision for his own people uh, and had the strength and the ruthlessness to impose that vision. The picture of Shaka as a dangerous and unstable despot is not shared by many of today's Zulus. They see the man who brought them together. He was a king of kings, I'll put it in that way. That means uh, he was the greatest king. He had the brilliant idea of uniting the nations because we were scattered. Some were small, some were big, some were respected, some not. Now we wanted to have a new brand of a new nation. But although we know about his achievements and his military courage, the hard facts about Shaka the man are quite limited. We don't know when he was born, we don't know what he looked like, and we don't know when he died exactly. Now the three major aspects of any person's biography are actually lost to us. We only have one actual drawing of Shaka, which was done by one of the white men who visited him. And in fact there's a lot of evidence to suggest that's been highly romanticised. So our physical understanding of Shark, it's quite difficult to get a grip on him. Um, but most accounts agree that he was fairly tall, he was fairly broad, he was a very powerful man. He dressed, of course, in the manner of the Zulus of the day, largely in animal skins. There's a good account of him wearing fringes of white cow tails tied to arm bands and leg bands. He wore a collar made up of twisted tails from monkeys and cat skins. He wore a similar sort of kilt around his waist. So, very spectacular physical appearance. Shaka Zulu's impressive figure didn't at first deter his enemies. The greatest threat to his plans for the expansion of Zululand was Chief Zawiti in the north. Chief Zawiti, a powerful warlord, was as ambitious as Shaka, and Zawiti held the upper hand. Shaka wasn't ready to face up to Zawiti immediately. So he consolidated his defenses by moving to a new Zulu capital at Kwa Bulawayo. With a taste of things to come, he named it the Place of Killings. This is Kwa Bulawayo, which was Shaka's first major settlement, or capital it's sometimes called, which he built here after he retreated south. And he established an umuzi, or settlement, around me here, down the slope, with his hut more or less where we are now, and the site was chosen, I think, primarily for defensive reasons. It gave a very good lookout over the Implatusia Valley, which would be the most likely place for raiders to come from. But it was also a very good resource base. It was within easy reach of water supplies. It was within easy reach of the safety haven of the Ngoya Forest, should he need to retreat any further. 
and they would have been grazing for the cattle both summer and winter as they could move them up and down these slopes. The outer palisade seems to have been two to three hundred yards in diameter and that probably contained several hundred huts, maybe a couple of thousand people, it's very difficult to say. But inside the palisade would be very carefully ordered into family, the women would have been down towards the bottom and the less important people with the most important personages having huts close to the kings at the top of the slope. Shaka knew that he would be outnumbered by Chief Zawidi's raiders, the Njwandwe. He was buying time so he could build up his own army. He drew together his warriors and prepared them for the inevitable battle ahead, and he used the time to make a new arsenal of weapons. Zulu blacksmiths forged thousands of the short stabbing spears that would be needed to repel the attackers. Shaka knew that an invasion for the Mdwandwi was only just around the corner. In 1818, Shaka, the Zulu leader, was facing his greatest challenge yet. His northern rival, Chief Zuide, king of the Ndwandwi, had been waiting for the moment to strike. Now he was ready to attack the heart of Shaka's territory, endangering Shaka himself. The Ndwandwe army had more than 12,000 warriors, outnumbering Shaka's forces by about two to one. Shaka, entrenched at his Kwabulueo stronghold, was going to need all his cunning against an awesome enemy. Shaka had prepared a battle plan, using a formidable military maneuver known as the Horns of the Bull. The move wasn't his invention, but he had refined it perfectly for his battle. Basically, you had three tactical bodies side by side, one, two, three. Um, in the center you had a body which was called the chest, which advanced straight at the enemy, and then on either side you had flanking parties, encircling parties, which they called the horns. Shaka's aim wasn't just to surround his enemy on all sides, but to do it secretly. That way his men could get in close with their lethal stabbing spears and finish the enemy off. King Shaka instructing the horns on the sides to lie down so that they hide away from the eyes of the enemies. And then as soon as the enemies get closer enough and then he'll start shouting, he will say, Sebe Pagat, which means they are now close enough, just to inform the horns to rise up. The horns used to be the young warriors who could run very fast and they could start encircling the enemies. And the enemies find themselves being in the center of the circle and they start stepping them using their stepping spears. The horns of the bull maneuver was just one of the ruses Shaka used to outwit the Ndwandwe. What he did was retire before the Ndwandwe advance. He left cattle and things to lure off some of their army to reduce their numbers. He mounted attacks at night. Small parties would sneak into their camp and just stab men in the darkness to cause panic and fear. Eventually, the Ndwandwe then start to retreat, uh, and Shaka pursued them, and as they were crossing a river, Shaka then struck them, and he broke up this major concentration of Ndwandwe troops, actually scattered them, uh, pretty much destroyed the Ndwandwe as a viable threat, and in the process, uh, very much made himself uh, the ruler of Greater Zululand. Shaka had crushed his enemy. Now he made sure they would never march against him again. After he defeated their army in battle, he sent his regiments into their country to destroy their huts, and he said to them, even smash their hearthstones so that there will be no way that these people can live here again if they don't submit to Shaga. Uh, this is what happens if you go up against me. With the Ndwandwe opposition destroyed, Shaka carried on with his plans for the expansion of Zululand. By 1821, Shaka Zulu's empire had grown to over 9,000 square miles of Southeast Africa. His military campaigns guaranteed prosperity for the people and rich rewards for his faithful troops. There was certainly a sense in which the Zulu people became wealthy under King Shaka. There was a competition at the time for natural resources. It's one of the elements which led to conflict in the region. And there's no doubt commanding a, a much wider area of territory gave the Zulus access to good grazing ground and water for their herds throughout the year. But also the Zulu were growing rich in cattle. One reads about Shaka's impis returning from campaigns, bringing thousands of cattle with them. But while his men feasted, Shaka's busy mind was devising yet more new military tactics 
and ways to improve his fearsome fighting force. He recognized that speed and the ability to run fast in battle were crucial to success. He made all warriors fight barefoot on pain of death. He arranged for a certain thorn from a, an African acacia bush to be strewn over a parade ground. And he said to the men, right, get your shoes off now. You can come in here and you can dance these thorns flat. I want to see them crushed into the dust. And one or two men objected to this and immediately Shaka had them knocked on the head with club sticks and killed. And of course, everybody else then decides, oh, no, OK, we better get on with it. When armies turned and fled in their clumsy sandals, they had no chance against the barefooted Zulus. Right from the beginning, you have this sense of drive and ruthlessness that Shaka has this vision of how men should work in combat, how tough they should be, what's needed, what's required of them to make them efficient. And he's prepared to kill people to make sure that it happened. But as the victories grew, so did the cruelty. Children, women, the old, none were spared. Henry Francis Finn tells a bloody tale about Shaka's callous murder of his own infant son. Shaka objected to being called a father by one of his mistresses. He seized the little innocent and threw it into the air. It was killed by the fool. The mother was instantly put to death. His family were just the immediate victims of a wrath which spared no one, least of all his army. The coward's bush punishment killings of those warriors deemed to have held back in battle added to his bloodthirsty reputation. Sitting under this bush, Shaka would then say, this is the thing then that you fear so much. And he would have these men hold up their arms apparently and then they would stick the spear into them uh, and finish them off. And he'd say, there we are. Uh, it's better actually to go and face it in open battle because otherwise you're gonna have to face it with me when you come back anyway. Uh, and the bush that he sat under is still growing in Zululand to this day. The extent of the coward's bush killing may be disputed, but the stories only help build the legend. He needed to punish cowardice in some form. He needed to get men to follow him. The circumstances were dire. The nation was under considerable threat. So he had to promote military valor by whatever means he needed to. But it's unlikely that he killed off large numbers of his own soldiers, who he would need very badly in battle anyway. Shaka recognized the importance of psychology. He used both fear and humiliation to discipline wayward warriors. He would get his cows to eat meat soaked in milk, which was the kind of food fed to babies. So in other words, he was implying that they were childish or immature and that would shame them in front of their peers and hopefully promote greater valor in the next encounter. At the Zulu capital, Kwabuluweo, music and dance played an important role in all aspects of Zulu life. Dancing was a part of the ritual build-up to battle, and ritual provides a constant reminder of a king's power and authority. But even at court, a Zulu subject had to be wary. Um, his court was famous for the fact that he was very strict with everybody in attendance. Uh, if you coughed in the middle of his speech, you were likely to get taken off and knocked on the head. If you made him laugh, if you cracked a joke when he was trying to be serious and spoilt the mood, you were likely to be knocked on the head. Henry Francis Fenn wrote in his diaries. He liked to impress by unpredictable executions. One famous place for murder was a high cliff named Execution Rock. Execution Rock became a place to be regarded with absolute fear. It was the definitive symbol of Shaka's rule of terror. There's an element of definitely intimidating everybody uh, by using the death penalty so frequently. But half a dozen people might in a given day be taken off to the place of execution. They were thrown off a cliff and down into a river to be eaten by the crocodiles. So it was a fairly uh, nerve-wracking place to actually go and attend to King Shaka himself. But while Shaka asserted his grim authority in Zululand, elsewhere in Africa other forces were stirring. Change was afoot, and it wouldn't leave Shaka untouched. After eight years of autocratic rule, the cracks started to appear in Shaka's Zulu kingdom. The first warning sign was the arrival in Port Natal of a party of British adventurers, including Henry Francis Fenn. 
They had heard about Shaka's wealth and had come to trade for ivory, minerals, and exotic goods. But their long-term aim was to build a colonial settlement, and their arrival was viewed with apprehension. In 1824, the first whites arrive in the area and are very much the harbingers of, of doom and destruction as far as the Zulus are concerned. Shaka was attracted to these whites, he was interested in them, uh, they had guns which fascinated him. But at the same time, he recognised straight away there was a conflict inherent in their arrival in the area, and that ultimately one day the Zulus would pay the price for that. While the three English adventurers were staying at Shaka's royal homestead, there was an attempt on Shaka's life by an assassin from a rival tribe. Henry Francis Finn helped to treat Shaka's wounds. I washed the wound with chamomile tea and bound it with linen. He had been stabbed with an assegai spear in the left arm and stomach. Shaka believed that the European's medicine had saved his life and wanted to express his thanks. The British adventurers seized a moment for their own gain. They persuaded Shaka to grant them land to establish a permanent settlement. This included Port Natal, modern Durban, and the land formed the foundations of the first British colony in the area. It was a dangerous foot in the door. The next threat showed that even the most powerful ruler, like Shaka, can fall victim to his own innermost fears. He had no worries yet about external forces, but did have a fear of dark internal forces, the power of witchcraft. Shaka's life is full of stories about dreams and witchcraft and witches hunting down certain people, of Shaka politically trying to resist the, the influence of those Inyangas or medicine men who had considerable force in the community. The Zulu people believed that powerful ancestral spirits worked through their chief, Shaka. He was also very much the spiritual head of the nation. He was the embodiment uh, of the ancestral spirits, all of the powerful spirits that the Zulu people believed in. Uh, and as such, such, his person, therefore, uh, was regarded with a sense of reverence, with a sense of great potency and power. Anything that Shaka had touched or had intimate contact with could be used by his enemies. The man who ruled by fear was himself afraid. In his own mind, witchcraft was his weak link the method by which he could be brought down. If an enemy managed to get into the household and gain something personal as intimate as the shavings from Shaka's face, uh, they could be used to great effect against the Zulu people through magical means. Every aspect of Shaka's life was watched in case it made him vulnerable. This involved looking out for the workings of evil spirits. All of his food was very carefully prepared to keep it free from poison, but also to make sure that nobody had cast any sort of evil influences over it, which would affect not only his person, but the nation as a whole. But despite the impending threat from the British expansion, and despite these primeval fears, Shaka's empire was stable and far-reaching. In 1827, it was pretty much at its most powerful. That year, Shaka moved his capital to Quad de Cusa, the modern town of Stanger. He held 20,000 square miles of central Zululand between the Black Mfalosi River in the north and the Thukela River in the south, all firmly under his control. But at the very height of his power, a personal tragedy turned into the greatest threat yet. In spring 1827, Shaka was out hunting when news arrived that his beloved mother, Nandi, had died. Nandi's death was a shocking blow by itself. It may have been more devastating still if, as many believe, Shaka himself killed her. His secret fears would have supplied the motive. He's supposed to have been very wary of raising up an heir who obviously would challenge in later life uh, his accession. And there are rumours, not really more than that, that he actually fathered a number of children at different times in, in his life uh, and that he actually then had them killed off quietly behind the scenes uh, before they grew to adulthood, uh, before they could ever actually challenge him. One story suggests that Nandi, his mother, secretly hid one of Shaka's children. And when Shaka found out, he went into a rage and violently attacked her. There's some versions that say that Shaka killed Nandi, but I'm sure that these are stories that were propagated afterwards. It's almost virtually certain from the contemporary sources that she died of natural causes, 
dysentery or something related to that. And she was buried here in the middle of what would have been her kraal, her umuzi, which was not far from Kabulawaya and was a seat of some power for her. She was a powerful woman under Shaka. What everybody is agreed on is that Shaka was overcome with grief. He gave Nandi a traditional royal burial. Henry Francis Finn wrote in his diary. At the burial, Nandi was placed in a sitting position and 10 of her handmaidens had their arms and legs broken and were buried alive with her in order to look after her and serve her in the new world. The death of Nandi had a traumatic effect on Shaka. He was driven mad by grief and embarked on a new wave of atrocities. In just 12 years, Shaka had forged the greatest nation in Africa, but there was a heavy cost in blood and cruelty. Shaka's reign of terror began to collapse during the outpouring of grief over the death of his mother, Nandi. On Nandi's death, Shaka was said to have been, by some, to have been precipitated into grief, such that there was an enormous orgy of killing. People who were not mourning properly, were not found with tears in their eyes, were killed off. And Finn alleged that some 7,000 people were killed. Now, none of the other accounts support that. Shaka may have used the death of his mother as an excuse to purge internal opposition. It's almost certain that there were some opportunistic killings, but as soon as Shaka heard about them, he stopped them. Probably very, very few people were actually killed. The traditional Zulu belief system required three months of intense mourning. No crops were to be grown, no milk to be drunk. This was a period of self-sacrifice. It seemed to have been traditional that in order to expunge the grief of the loss that a raid would have to be conducted on a neighboring people and a certain amount of cattle taken and brought back and given in tribute, as it were, to the memory of the lost one. There are legendary stories of the harsh measures imposed by Shaka Zulu, leading to barren fields and starvation. Thousands were massacred around that time. Even amid the slaughter, Shaka could respect those who honestly stood up to him. When King Shaka's mother died, nobody is allowed to milk the cows, nobody is allowed to plow the fields, and they all need to cry because they need to mourn for his mother. Then people died because they didn't have food. But except one man who went straight to him and just told him that if people die, who are you going to rule? Then, because Shaga wanted somebody who can speak truth, then he saw that this person can just go straight to him and tell the truth. And Shaga gave him a present of cows. He, he wanted somebody who's confident in whatever he believes in. That means if you come to Shaga, if you don't believe what he's saying, you can tell him your point of view. But Shaka's growing violence was endangering his very kingdom. His enemies began conspiring against him. It may well be that Shaka himself was losing his grip on power within the nation. Certainly there were, was an increase in killings in the last years of his reign. Uh, and there was a sense that even his own family felt, no, we've had enough of this now. He's pulled the country together. He has made this great kingdom. But where does it go from here? Eventually, Shaka fell victim to a palace coup. In the modern town of Stanger in South Africa, there's a statue in memory of Shaka, the warrior king. It was here in 1828 that Shaka's enemies, who included his own family, found the courage to strike. A plot coming from within the royal family was legitimized because it had that weight of tradition. It was his own brothers that killed him. And indeed, after his death, uh, the first thing his brothers did was to turn around and appeal, issue a sort of public appeal to the Zulu people uh, and saying, look, this man now was a tyrant. We had to finish him off. The chief conspirators were his two half-brothers, Dingani and Milangana. They had a lot to gain and could get close to him. Dingane was probably at loggerheads with Shaka for all their lives. And although he disappears from the record during Shaka's reign, he was clearly still around. And he was probably behind maybe three assassination attempts on Shaka. 
Their chance came in 1828 at Shaka's house. There was a failure in the protection which normally surrounded Shaka. He was left alone. Dingani and Milangana brutally stabbed the Zulu chief to death with the very stabbing spear Shaka had invented. Shaka had become a madman. Well, probably not quite a madman, but certainly he'd possibly outlived his usefulness uh, as far as the process of nation building was concerned. Dengani succeeded Shaka. He might have said he had acted to stop the killings, but he soon set off on a murder spree of his own, purging any possible opposition from Shaka's followers. Dingane felt a need to amplify the atrocities of Shaka precisely because it was an illegitimate killing. And therefore, in order to draw people onto his side, he needed to build up his propaganda machine. And he continued killing off um, Shakan followers for many years afterwards. King Shaka's dying prophecy was that the Zulu kingdom would be defeated by the European settlers. At the moment that his assassins pounced upon him, he turned round to them apparently and said, well, sons of my fathers, you won't gain anything by this. Uh, when I am gone, the land will see white people come. You will not rule when I am dead. Shaka's dying words came back with a vengeance to haunt his people. Within a decade, British and Dutch settlers were moving in, colonizing Zululand. With European colonialists spreading through Southern Africa, conflict was inevitable. But the Zulus had some resistance left, and they owed that to the legacy of Shaka's military genius. Even though Shaka had been dead for 50 years, he still gave the Zulus their finest hour. The Battle of Isant Luana in January 1879 is an extraordinary occasion in military terms. Uh, on one side, you have the most sophisticated, powerful military technology of the age, the British Empire, with breech-loading guns and artillery and rockets. On the other side, you have an African people who are still primarily, yes, they had firearms, but primarily uh, they're armed with shields and spears as they were in King Shaka's time. In this historic battle, Shaka's battle tactics inflicted a terrible defeat on the armies of the British Empire. For the Zulus, it was a spectacular victory. The British column was virtually wiped out. From an army of 1,700 troops, only 400 survived. The whole shark and thing, the use of scouts, the use of ground, the use of moving rapidly, really, during the Saint Luana campaign in early 1879, uh, the British are completely outclassed and outgeneraled. Even Shaka's legacy couldn't last. Superior British technology and firepower triumphed after six months of further battles. Today, the image of Shaka Zulu is either heroic warrior king or ruthless bloodthirsty tyrant. What is undeniable is Shaka Zulu forged one of the mightiest empires Africa has ever known. In 1816, when Shaka Zulu came to power, his people ruled over just 100 square miles. But his ambition had no limits. Building the Zulu nation was an extraordinary achievement. In just over 12 years, his military force had conquered more than 20,000 square miles of land. He fought against different tribes, so as soon as the tribe gets defeated, then he usually took all the belongings of the tribe, taking the wives, taking the livestock, and take, putting it under his control. His vast armies had defeated 100 tribes, and a quarter of a million people submitted to his authority. It was a rule of fear. The Zulu's finest hour came against the British at the Battle of Islanwana. Even after he had died, Shaka reached out to inspire the Zulu warriors this was Shaka's legacy. It was the people trained by Shaka using military applications invented by King Shaka, uh, which really stopped the British Empire briefly in its tracks. I think personally Shaka is a very dynamic, charismatic, 
ambitious, far-seeing individual, um, somebody who found himself in a culture which was in conflict at the time and saw very much where that could go and recognised, like, like a lot of fairly powerful figures throughout history, that the way to achieve something was, was to be ruthless about it. Um, so there is definitely a dark side to him. He was undoubtedly a violent man, uh, but at the same time he was arguably a visionary. He was a man who saw where his people could go uh, and he was prepared to use fairly ruthless and fairly dynamic means to achieve that uh, and his legacy is one that shaped uh, a good deal of modern South Africa in lots of ways certainly into the 19th century um, it influenced the course of, of southern African history very significantly and that's rolled right into modern times uh, and indeed a lot of people have a view of Shaka which means different things to them uh, today in southern Africa he is a very iconic and powerful figure still today Nobody has ever accused Shaka of being cuddly. Nobody. <laughs> um, I think he was one of a number of leaders in this region who were responding to um, an upsurge in violence over a period of maybe 50 or 70 years. Um, he was probably the most, almost certainly the most competent and successful of those leaders. The source of the violence is somewhat controversial. Um, my take on it is to involve slaving from southern Mozambique as one of the triggers that probably set it all off, but over quite a long term and in incremental stages. But Shaka was a man who found himself caught in this situation, found himself in charge of um, the nascent Zulu people, uh, who was still quite a small group, and did his best to defend those people and bring others to join him against a common situation, against a common enemy. So in many ways he was a defensive leader rather than offensive leader. Um, and he was a real human being, a real flesh and blood, mind and body, dealing with very real political situations and very real environmental constraints. He wasn't superhuman. He wasn't superhuman either in the direction of um, pathological violence and he wasn't superhuman in the direction of unbeaten military genius. He was surprise, surprise, somewhere in between. Um, and that, that, that is the basis of my portrait of him, is to try to interpret him as a real person responding to real situations and doing the best he could under very, very difficult circumstances. Well, because before, like I was saying, that we never had something like the Zulu Nation. It originated by him. He, he, he tried his level best to unite the nation through the wars, defeating different tribes to form one big Zulu nation. And then he's still very, very famous and popular to the Zulu nation even nowadays because we never had Zulu kingdom. So through him, we ended up having Zulu kingdom. Even in nowadays, we're still having our living king. What I was told is King Shaga was a bit a, a despotic to such an extent if somebody has been doing something wrong and then there were people responsible for putting those people to death. We call that a Ugusagwa Kanyao. I would say he was doing best because sometimes there are possibilities whereby the person should be despotic. Like to get people back on track, to discipline people because if you are soft all the times, things will be scattered, you know. So you have to be sometimes be, 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 be despotic be autocratic, that I want this to be done. It's the way of disciplining your people.